Okay, so we were talking about finding the equation of a line through two points, so the very, very classic material. And we talked about finding the slope of the line. The slope is the rise over the run. But of course, finding the slope of a line is only is only half the battle. The slope is that number m. You still have that b that you need to be able to find as well. So let's run through. I mean, we've we've talked about finding slope, but I don't remember what points we were using yesterday. So let's just start at the start. Say we have two points on the Cartesian plane. We want to find a line going through these points. To find the line, we need an M and we need a B. And this is, this is order in the sense that you have to find the slope first. So step one, find the slope. Step two, find the B. And we, we said last time that the slope is the rise over the run. And then we said, well, as far as what that what that concretely means, you subtract the y coordinates and you subtract the x coordinates and you divide. So negative three minus seven, five minus one. I regret to say that we're going to get some kind of fraction here, five minus one is four. So negative five over two is the slope of the line connecting these points. And we can write y equals negative five over two x plus b. And if we knew what b was, we have the equation of a line. So to proceed, we have to remember that these points were given our x and y values. So the point one comma seven says that when x equals one, y equals seven. And therefore, Seven should equal negative five halves times one plus b. Again, when x equals one, y ought to equal seven. And this then is an equation you have to solve. Um, it, it's hopefully a pretty straightforward equation. The only thing that maybe makes it not is that we do have to add fractions and get a common denominator.
Um, seven is fourteen halves. Add five halves to both sides. And we get that B is 19 halves. Y equals negative 5 halves X plus 19 halves. And one thing is worth commenting on here. I said, okay, these points are giving you information. When x equals one, y equals seven. Well, one comma seven is a point, but it's not the only point. Um, that second point is also giving us information. That second point is telling us when x equals five, y equals negative three. And we could have used the second point and we would have gotten exactly the same b. That is, We could have said x equals five, y equals negative three. So negative three is negative five halves times five plus b. Um, we would have ended up with some pretty um, slightly rockier math. Maybe. But let's verify that we really do get the same thing. Negative three is negative twenty five over two plus B. So negative six over two is negative 25 over two plus B. Add 25 over two to both sides. You do wind up with 19 over two which is the same value that we got using the other point. So it ultimately doesn't matter which point you use in this second step. And I guess step three is to make sure you actually solve the problem. If you're asked for an equation of a line, your answer should be an equation of a line. It shouldn't be a bunch of work on a page with M equals something over here and B equals something written over there, and your reader has to figure it out. So if our goal was to find the equation of a line through two points, well, there we go. And um, in most I mean, just sort of leveling with you. In most real world situations where we want to find a line that represents a function, we're going to have kind of messy data and this stuff won't work and we'll have to go to a computer and do sort of linear regression if that's a phrase that means anything to you. So this is very much a, a classroom style exercise, but it's also the kind of classroom style exercise you might be um, conducting one day. Um, to try to provide 
applications. I mean, there are a few ways you could do it. The classic application is temperature conversion. Um, so, We learn at a relatively young age that there are multiple ways of measuring temperature and that the two most commonly used scales in day-to-day -day life are Celsius and Fahrenheit. And in general, the way these are presented is in terms of the freezing point and the boiling point of water. We're told that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius versus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're told that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, and I always feel slightly unsure, but 212 degrees Fahrenheit, if I am remembering this correctly. And then we can tell kids, tell students, well, the relationship between the temperature and degrees Celsius and the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is a linear relationship. So if, for example, we want to call, let's see, what would we be most likely to want to do? Probably the Americans are most used to Fahrenheit. So what we most likely want to do is take a temperature in degrees Celsius and convert it to a temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So will that Celsius be our independent variable X and will that Fahrenheit be our dependent variable Y? And we ought to be able to write an equation y equals mx plus b, because the relationship between these is linear. And the statement that the relationship between these is linear is something that I'm just saying, but I hope that it, that it makes sense. So, I mean, it's a statement that increasing by one degree Celsius will always increase by some fixed amount of degrees Fahrenheit, which um, it, it would be a very weird temperature scale that did not have that property. So let's state as our goal, we want to find this relationship, y equals mx plus b, and let's, um, let's go. And the reason I'm able to say that is that we are given points here, even though you don't see the notation, parenthesis, number, comma, number, When it's zero degrees Celsius, it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit because water is freezing at that temperature. I mean, if it's freezing outside, it's going to be freezing no matter which temperature scale you are using. Likewise, water boils at some fixed temperature. If your water is starting to boil, it's 100 degrees Celsius. 
it's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So in general, making the conceptual wood jump from having, you know, a table of data to having points is probably the thing that people struggle with the most in these problems. Once we've made that leap, well, we're given two points. And we are asked to, um, to find the equation of the line between them. So the first thing we need to find is what? Slope. Slope. It always has to be in this order. Find M first, find B second. So to find M, we need to subtract the Y's and we need to subtract the X's. And um, if it's possible to keep everything positive, I usually do. So let's call this X1, Y1, and this X2, Y2. And then, though, it doesn't actually matter. If you reversed your x's and your y's, you'd wind up with a negative number up front and a negative number down below, and the negative signs would just cancel out. So 212 minus 2, 210, minus 10, 200, minus another 20, 180 divided by 100 is 18 over 10 is 9 over 5. So not the loveliest um, fraction, but it is what it is. Y equals nine over five X plus B. And now we're going to take one of those points and we're going to plug it in. We could select either point, zero comma 32 or a hundred comma um, 212, it seems to me that one of these points is going to be easier to work with, that being 0, 32. 0.32. And the reason I think this is going to be easier to work with is that now, multiplying nine fifths by zero is the easiest thing to do. Nine fifths times zero is zero, as opposed to multiplying nine fifths by a hundred. Thirty-two equals B. And making sure that we actually solve the problem and write down the conversion equation, y equals 9 fifths x plus 32. Um, and again, this is going from degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 
I guess what I would say is that in real life, nine fifths is pretty close to ten fifths, which is two. So in real life, you can get a pretty good approximation by multiplying by two and adding three. Um, that's probably what we do in most real world situations. Um, what's 15 degrees? It's about 15 times 2 is 30, plus another 30 is 60. It's about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's finding equations of lines through points. Um, it sounds like it was reviewed for a lot of you, but again, it is very classic material. Um, does anybody have questions about it before we press on? Then the next topic is systems of linear equations. And it's actually it's actually quite a uh, quite a full topic. If any of you uh, are feeling inspired, you could sign up for Math 337 next semester and study these for an entire um, 16 weeks. But we are just going to kind of touch on the basics. And we are going to look specifically and almost exclusively at the situation where we have two equations and two variables. So a system of linear equations occurs when you have, well, multiple linear equations which all must be true. And when you're working with systems of linear equations, you normally don't write y equals mx plus b. What you normally have is the so-called general form of a linear equation, ax plus by equals c, or some c. And, you know, just to, to reassure us, I mean, if you have 2x plus 3y equals 7, this is not written in the, the y equals mx plus b form that we're used to, but we could rewrite it. Y equals seven thirds minus two thirds X. So equations that look like this really are linear. And equations that look like that show up a lot in, in the kind of situation where we get systems of linear equations. I mean, maybe I should just sort of give an example. So the classic um, 
sort of adult child example. When I say that something's like classic, what I mean is that if you start going through textbooks, like I don't know if you're going to have to do that for like a curriculum class, but what you'll start to see is that some examples just show up in every single textbook. One of those examples looks like this. A bear sells 3,000 tickets. So there are adult tickets and child tickets. Let's say X. is an adult ticket, and let's say an adult ticket costs four dollars. And let's say Y is a ticket for a child. And maybe a ticket for a child costs $2. So the statement that the fair has sold 3,000 tickets means that the adult tickets they've sold, plus the child tickets they've sold, equals 3,000. And then let's say the fair made um, nine thousand dollars. Well, it's a little more convoluted, but this statement can also be turned into a linear equation. Um, what's this statement as a linear equation of x and y? Can someone give that to me? Okay. Well, let's break this down a little. If the fair sold X tickets to adults, and every ticket that sold to an adult gave them $4, how much money did they get from the adult tickets? 4X is exactly it. Okay. Correct. And if they sold Y tickets to child, to children, at $2 per ticket, then from selling tickets to children, they made $2Y dollars. And the total amount of money they made was $9,000. And this is a system of linear equations because we have two linear equations and they both have to be true. X plus Y has to equal 3,000 or X plus 2Y has to equal 9. And a bit of notation, when we have a system of linear equations and we want to indicate that fact, we basically just list that. X plus Y equals 
four was three thousand four x plus two y equals nine thousand. But to, if we want to sort of make it very clear that both of these equations need to be true, and we're looking at them as a system, we put all the brackets to the left of them. So what's this doing? I mean, I say that both of these equations must be true. Um, well, the key sort of point here is that if all we knew were that the fair sold 3,000 tickets, if we didn't have this information, we would not be able to answer the question, what's X and what's Y, because there would be a bunch of answers. They could have sold all, only tickets to adults. They could have sold um, 2,999 tickets to adults. And there's one of the kind of forlorn child running about. They could have sold 2,000 tickets to adults and 1,000 tickets to children. There are a bunch of um, ways you could solve this equation. And I mean, of course, in the real world, you can only sell a, um, a whole number of tickets. I mean, you can't sell half a ticket to someone, but, just looking at this equation as a pure math thing, there are in fact an infinite number of solutions. And that infinite number of solutions is, let me, uh, this is gonna take forever, maybe I'll, Just this thing manually, there we go. So every point on this line is a possible solution to x plus y equals 3,000. Um, similarly, if we weren't Toward this, if we weren't told there were 3,000 tickets, if we were only told they made $9,000, that would not be allowed enough to tell us what X and Y are. Going back to Desmos, 4X plus 2Y equals 9,000. Any combination of values on this line will give us a revenue of $9,000. But if you look at both lines on the same, at the same time, suddenly there's only one value of X and Y that makes sense. And by a stunning coincidence, I got a nice solution. Um, 1,500 adults, 1,500 children. Um, this point is on this line, so it gives us the right revenue. It's on this line, so it gives us the right number of tickets. And there's only one possible value of X and Y that give us both the right number of tickets and the right revenue. 
So when you're talking about solving systems of linear equations, you are looking for something that satisfies both the systems of linear equations. Here, this linear equation has infinite solutions. This linear equation has infinite solutions, but we put them together. And we get one solution. And now, um, let me see. Sort of conceptually, I want to take a step back here. Um, ordinarily, I mean, if you look at the stuff we were doing last week, y equals mx plus b, um, there's an idea that X and Y are playing different roles in the equation, right? X is an independent variable, Y is a dependent variable. When we're talking about systems of linear equations, we normally don't have any conception of dependent or independent variables. We just have two variables. Um, so that's sort of a conceptual comment I want to make. And now let me state some goals. And one of them we'll accomplish today, and one of them we'll accomplish on Friday. The goal we will accomplish today, I'm saying it a little vaguely using the word investigate, but we will investigate the question of how many solutions a system might have. And then the goal we'll accomplish Friday is, well, we, we'd like to be able to solve systems of linear equations, or at least solve small systems of linear equations. So I said we uh, we try to do this first thing today, so we better move right on. Um, in the example we just saw, we had one possible solution. And I would describe that as being kind of the default case. Like, I, the reason it was so remarkable that we ended up with quite a nice answer is that I did just make these numbers up off the top of my head, but I never doubted that we were going to wind up with a single solution. So I'd say that one, having one solution is the most common case. What are the alternatives? Well, going back to Desmos, taking another look at this, 
The solution is the point where the lines intersect. And if we think of solutions as that, um, it's probably pretty clear, for example, that we cannot have two solutions. Like try to take two straight lines and draw them in a way so that they touch each other exactly twice. There is no way it can be done. In fact, the, um, the things that can happen are extremely limited. Um, they might touch. In that case, we'll get a solution where they do touch. They might not touch. Um, the lines are called what tier? Parallel. Parallel. You could have parallel lines. And if the lines are parallel, they're never going to intersect. And we could have No solutions. Um, it might seem like um, having no solutions is a pretty uninteresting case. Actually, there are um, there are very important applications where you do have systems of linear equations that don't have solutions. This is sort of going beyond anything in the textbook, but if you've ever seen the idea of linear regression, you have a bunch of data that's almost but not quite in a straight line. And you find the so-called line of best fit. Um, this is done using a system of linear equations. And the system of linear equations doesn't have any solutions because that line can actually go through all of the points. So then you're in a situation where you're saying, okay, there aren't any solutions, but what's the closest we can get to a solution? Well, that's 337 material. We won't be discussing it um, in this class. I just want to sort of emphasize that even this case is useful in concrete settings. And then the sort of the only other case is maybe these two lines aren't two lines at all. Maybe they are the same line and they are lying perfectly one on top of the other. And if these two lines are lying perfectly one on top of another, they intersect in an infinite number of places. And again, this is something that might sound goofy, but actually, um, has applications, important applications. And I mean, it probably sounds goofy in the sense that if your two lines are really the same line, what are you doing with two lines? Why are you looking at a system? Why don't you just look at a single line? But this comes up uh, is anyone here taking like intro to chemistry or anything? No? Okay. Well, in chemistry, you talk about balancing chemical equations. And you might get like, there's one atom of hydrogen or two atoms of oxygen. But that same equation, you could have two atoms of hydrogen or four atoms of oxygen there are actually an infinite number of ways that equation could balance. 
And what's going on mathematically is that you are solving a system of equations that has an infinite number of solutions. So I said that one solution is the most common case, which is true. I mean, if you just imagine just taking these, these things that I'm using as lines and just dumping them on the table, what, what are the chances that they wind up perfectly parallel? Not very good. But all of these cases do have interesting real world applications. Um, Friday, we'll talk about solving these and what happens if there's one solution or no solutions or infinitely many solutions. Um, so you, I mean, I will post the video. Um, I, I think I'm a little behind on getting stuff posted, but I will do that. Um, I'm not going to be tedious about this. I'll just say that if you don't show up Friday, you are still responsible for the material we go over. Will we have homework Friday? Um, I mean, yes, but I could email it to you or um, oh, yeah. post it on Canvas or whatever. That would, yeah, that would be posting it. Right. Posting it. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you.